Dear Boomers, with my 40 years as a nurse, I've come to value the profound sense of fulfillment and being present at the most pivotal times of a person's life, the birthbed, the deathbed, and the sickbed. And while many might shy away from this kind of experience, because they're so intense, I've come to embrace them as a symbol and the essence of true service and humanity. Let me explain. Let's start first with the birthbed. I've had numerous experiences with that, and sometimes births go well, and sometimes they don't. But for the most part, they go well. And I have said before, that doesn't mean that the baby is not traumatized in some way. And they, of course, that kind of trauma is hard to uncover because it's so unconscious. But the birthbed experiences that I've had are most profound with natural childbirth. And I'm not saying that an epidural is not, if a person wants one, they should have one. But a lot of times they're removed from the profound experience of the birth because they are kind of out of it. So there is that. But the natural childbirth that I've experienced, say one time we did, uh, played Izzy's rendition of It's a Wonderful Life. And that was great. The mother and the whole family were, and this was her first baby. The r profound rhythm of that song and the, the expectation and anticipation of this amazing soul coming into the world really was very emotional and, and very wonderful. And I don't think people are often prepared for that kind of emotional release that happens after a birth of a baby. And another time, I remember a woman laughing a baby out, and, and that was unusual. I've never seen that before. She laughed and laughed and laughed, and suddenly the baby was born. Wow. And that was easy. Uh, and then she cried. <laughs> Um, I've worked, and then I worked with the Amish for 10 years and they all did natural childbirth. And, um, one in family in particular will always, always stand out to me. This baby was born alive and there was no reason ever to expect that anything was going to be different than that. But about, uh, an hour after the baby was born and we had been doing regular checks on that one hour period. I went in to check the baby and the baby was no longer breathing. So we, my midwife and I did resuscitation called 911 and the baby had been, uh, was transported to a local hospital where I used to work. And um, the baby did not live. Um, so this family was very, very forgiving and the Amish are known for forgiveness. They wanted my midwife and I to be present for the next birth of their baby, which would, is unheard of in the so-called English community because they, they were blamed, they would, the English community would have blamed us for what happened, even though really there was no blame involved and really there never should be. But in this case, there was really no blame, no one to blame. And it was the, I think it was the baby's destiny to go on to another realm of existence very, fairly quickly. So I went to visit this family a day or two after the death of the baby, and um, they were exp explaining to me how the baby symbolized to them the flower of the rose. And even before the uh, death of the baby, they had decided that the rose, the roses were very profound to them. And all of a sudden, after the death of the baby, the whole garden erupted in roses, even roses that they didn't even know they had planted and probably hadn't. It was a gift from the divine. These roses, uh, even before the baby, even before these roses bloomed like that, they had set up an altar with a rose on it for the baby. And that is exactly when these roses bloomed. I was, uh, and then and then the father said that his, um, their, the Amish community believes in the church first, community second, and then family third. 
And I don't know if any of you saw the movie Witness, that was quite a while ago. But uh, when the thing happened with uh, the bad cop showing up at the Amish farm and the, and the uh, gentleman of the house ringing a bell and all the Amish coming up over the hill, this situation was very much like that because as we started the birth process in the house, it was a home birth that kind of went away and then we went back to the birth center. The, uh, the bed collapsed and all of a sudden the plumbing in the bathroom started, had broken down. And uh, that's why we had to go to the birth center for the birth. And then when I went back to the house, the, everything was completely fixed. The whole community was there working on everything. The women were in the kitchen cooking. The men were fixing everything. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this, you know, the whole idea of the barn raising, the Amish barn raising things, they do that with every single part of their lives, helping and they, they do this stuff in service to God, basically. So that was one thing. And then um, there's also the deathbed itself. And often it's the sick bed before it becomes the deathbed. And I had the privilege of being with our oldest family friend as she was dying of cancer. And uh, I found it so interesting that she did not want anyone to talk about death in her presence, which was unusual to me because usually when people are dying, they want you to talk about death. They want you to discuss the death process, what it is that they hope to happen or the things that they're afraid will happen and they want you to discuss this stuff or else at least to psychically connect with their journey. She, if I would have brought up the word death, she would have thrown me out of the house. Isn't that odd? I mean, no, it's just the way it was, but to me it was odd at the time and I have come to see that that's just exactly what she needed. She knew what was going on, but she didn't need anybody else to give her their opinion on death and what was she was going through it was her journey. And it was not, and she didn't really trust anybody else to know what she was going through. So there was that. She did die peacefully uh, and um, we were, I was not present for her death, but I was there many, many nights with her because I did the night shift with her. And uh, those nights were very interesting. Very interesting. It was an old ancestral house. There were things that were going on that I felt the ancestors were there kind of helping her through. Her mother had died of cancer. Her father and sister had died of cancer. And don't ask me why, she decided to die of cancer too, even though she may not have known she had a choice in the matter. So there was that, and that was very interesting, may I say, very interesting. Of course, I have discussed the death of my mother, which uh, gave me the profound gift of unconditional love. And then my husband's death was, wow. That was a wild thing because I knew he had been sick. We had both been, been kind of sick with a high fever. And when all of a sudden he, um, he, he died and he did that incredible exhale, which all of a sudden I knew, oh my God. And I did resuscitation and I called the ambulance, even though he never would have liked that, but I thought that that was something the family would have expected me to do. And I, you know, you have to do certain, th certain things like that for other people too. And uh, he was put on life support and he did not make it through. And, and then it became apparent. Now in those days, they weren't really uh, diagnosing COVID, but he had huge blood clots on his heart and around the lungs. And those things are indicative of COVID. Plus he had that this is his fourth heart attack and heart complications and COVID seemed to go hand in hand. So I put it together myself, even though it was not an official diagnosis. Um, 
while he was on life support, his grandchild, our grandchild, was, I know he went to visit the grandchild in spirit. And uh, the child was very, usually slept very well, was very, very, you know, fighting sleep and was crying. And he didn't necessarily mention his grandfather, but it was, uh, you know, a, a, it was a heart-to-heart -heart connection that occurred. That was interesting, and I think my husband Tommaso went to visit several other people. He was certainly has been visiting me for the last four years. So there's that, and then there's the sick bed without dying. That is something we experience many, many times in the hospital, and and of course the the birth bed even before the person delivers. We're there, we're there with them, we're taking care of them, we're helping them breathe. And breath is so important with all of these processes. The thing that helped my friend who didn't want to hear about death was me reading things that her father had written. Um, her father was a homeopathic physician in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she loved him so much. We all loved him. He was a saint a very important person in all of our lives. So I was reading some of the stuff he wrote, and uh, in particular, he wrote something about what we all were familiar with, which was a certain type of therapeutic massage that flushed the lymph system. It was working along the spine to flush the lymph system and purify the healing process. And I read that book to her that he had written and she was listening with such intensity and in some ways I felt like he was visiting the deathbed too the sickbed and then the deathbed and um, he was a spectacular human being which I will have to go into at another time because <laughs> it's just too much to talk about right now and of course his wife my friend's mother she was spectacular too. In fact, I had mentioned earlier the meditation of concentrating on the feet so that you don't fall. That was something that came from her. The feet are the center of the will in the body. And if you are afraid of falling and you put your energy into your feet, you probably will not fall. But those are the things I've been thinking about on this beautiful day. I had to restart this video five times because my dogs were misbehaving. <laughs> and I want you all to think about the deathbed, the birthbed, and the sickbed as a way of connecting to all those things that are important, that are profoundly important in our lives. There's no way I can really explain how these things have affected me other than to say I know that they have. So if you like this video, please subscribe and um, subscribe to the, to the YouTube channel and also place a notification for when I come on again. Love to you all. Bye-bye.